So I'll I'll just kind of give a give a give a greeting and a welcome to those that are going to watch on the recording in the next couple of days after we've done all of this. Um, I think we're kind of getting there. There's a few folks here. I don't know if anyone wants to say hello. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Barry. Hello. Martin. Hello, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to we're going to look at um, at Psalm two tonight, and just to kind of give some of the background, um, most of most folks are aware of the kind of the story of of me kind of feeling like the Lord saying about um, about starting to kind of produce these little booklets, and thank you very much for partnering in me and doing that. It is absolutely fantastic, um, and part of the of actually wanting to do these teaching sessions is it becomes something that attracts more people. Because obviously we can get a large number of, of small partners, um, then it, it just helps me get these things written um, in a kind of a, it, within a lifestyle that works. Um, but when I when I felt the Lord said that, I had a real strong sense of um, as I was doing them, things would go onto PowerPoint, and from PowerPoint because they're getting out of my head, the information out of my head, they're then getting into the little booklets from writing. Um, but as part of that that kind of picture, often I say that in it I saw a, a time when you could pick up a Bible. And you could open it, it was like a study Bible, and it, every page there was something that just pointed out how Jesus appears within the passages. And I, I always thought at the time, what it really needs is a kind of a version of the Bible that has been put together um, to actually kind of help to, to stand alongside the teaching. Um, actually, for, for me, as some of you will remember, um, uh, Trevor, um, I've lost his second name now, it's terrible, that's one of the things, I have a recall thing since the strokes, but um, Trevor, who, who translated, you know, Translation Trust, translated the Bible into Turkish. Um, anyway, he, I remember sitting down for coffee with him once, and him just saying, there's so much in the Hebrew that you can't see in the English, because the translators have made a legitimate decision, because you can only make one choice with a word, and you tend to draw out that one choice. Um, and But there's so many of those things that actually, if you translated them differently, you would have a better sense of Jesus in and so I always felt it would be really nice if there was a, a, a version of the Bible that kind of tried to draw that out it wasn't trying to be too radical trying to be too clever and um, so what I've thought I'd try and do is as I'm going along is actually producing a kind of a, a Jesus centered version um, which I've based um, on the the World English Bible which is copyright free it's public domain um, and I use that as my my foundation and um, that that itself is based um, on the um, it's on some of the later Masoretic texts, the Hebrew, and some people prefer if you use the Textus Receptus and so on, that kind of issue. But it, it's, a, it's a good, solid, um, almost word-for-word -word type of translation. So it's a good base. And then what I've tried to do is, is approach that and obviously modernize some of the English, but also to try and capture the wording in such a way that it, it perhaps works as you kind of teach how Jesus appears and, and stands with it. So that's what the, the text is that I've sent through to everybody. I thought we'd just kind of use that as our basis tonight as we kind of work through Psalm 2. So I'm just going to pray and then we're going to unpack that kind of um, that text. So Father, um, it is a privilege to be able to do what we do and it is kind of a miracle of technology that we can be miles and miles apart and yet share thoughts and insights and just be inspired by the way you sit at the heart um, of, of a message that in one sense, you know, we think it's so it's so old but it is still so fresh and Jesus I ask for its freshness to come through tonight in Jesus name amen amen now I'm just looking for where I put my little clicker you see this is the trouble and, oh there it is there's my clicker so I think this still works if I click through note my clicker doesn't seem to want to work anymore and I think that is because I am not sharing it oh feel free to start sharing has the thing just disappeared from everybody's slides? Yeah, yeah, it has. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put it back up again. Um, so share point, uh, point file. Um, sorry about that. Open. This will be a real shame if we don't get this working tonight. This is on mute. This file is already in the meeting. Yeah. So council. So it's already in the meeting. So what do I need? To, it's attachments. Manage content. Online presentation. It's not showing. Hang on. Your online presentation. You want to see it now? Is it appearing? No. No. It's not appearing. Oh dear. I'm really sorry, folks. <laughs> um, I will try it the other way. Share desktop. Um, 
Yeah, something's happening now. Uh, let's do from the beginning. See if that works any better. Yeah. So you can you can see that. Can you see me as well? Yes. Okay. Well, that works then. So I can I can look at um, what I'm working through. So working through Psalm two. So Psalm two <clears throat> is um is the first messianic psalm. And there are there are eight psalms. Some of you will be aware that specifically. Um, I know I was talking about this with you, Sarah, the other day. So you'll be aware there's eight psalms that specifically refer to the Messiah. Um, and this is the first one. And it's a real it's a real kind of kicker in one sense. Um, you know, Psalm one is a nice gentle introduction to the book. You know, the righteous man and how he doesn't hang around with ungodly people. Then you hit Psalm two, and it's incredibly rich. <laughs> Um, and um, we see the kind of the word Messiah. I've, I've drawn it out here, verse two. Um, it hits us. So the kings of the earth promote themselves. The rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against His anointed Messiah. So you can see that that little highlighted word, the anointed Messiah, is one of the things I've done with the Jesus Center Bible. Is is I could you could translate the the Hebrew Messiah as either Messiah or as anointed. I've just done put the two together and make it really obvious to folks that we're talking about Jesus here. Uh, and then it, it, it's, um, they're, they're taking a stand against the, the anointed Messiah and, and they're saying stuff. And so the next 10 verses of the psalm kind of unpack the things that are being said. Um, and as we run through that, we're going to find that actually this psalm is, is referenced in the New Testament um, in reference to Jesus' baptism. It's referenced in terms of um, Jesus' passion in the suffering of the last week of Jesus' life. Um, it's referenced in terms of his ascension as well. Um, and I've, uh, on the other side of the page there, you'll notice they're saying, so in that sense, there is an anointing that goes with each of those e e events, those incidents. Um, obviously, the, uh, his baptism, Jesus is anointed by the Holy Spirit and we water. So he goes into the Jordan, the, the water anoints him. As he comes up out of the, the Jordan, the, the Holy Spirit anoints him. Um, in his Passion Week, obviously, um, he's anointed by Mary, who anoints him with, um, with oil mixed perfume, perfume that's kind of based in, in an oil. So it's, a, it's an anointing. Um, and in the text, it kind of Jesus turns her anointing as to being him, her doing it for him because of his death. But um, remember, when when this happens, um, Jesus is having a meal um, in the context of a of a wealthy man's house, Simon. And um, these Jewish homes, often these kind of meals were in the kind of courtyard area. They were built with rooms around the courtyard. And so lots of people from the, the village are looking in and there's a lot of interest in what's going on. Um, with Jesus because Lazarus is there as well so it's the, the, the one that's got raised from the dead and the person who raised him they're all in one place so there's a whole crowd of people and what they see is they see someone anointing Jesus and him accepting the anointing in a week where he is ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey and fulfilling the prophecy from Zechariah about behold your king so there's a very kind of clear sense in which in the Passion Week there is a very real anointing done by Mary and then um, in Jesus' ascension, as we read in Hebrews, it makes a statement of him um, about how in his ascension that he is anointed with joy above his companions or the oil of gladness, the, the oil of happiness, the oil of joy. And so there's a description of anointing in Jesus' ascension. So in all of those things, there's an anointing. And actually, we find that the New Testament in all three of those contexts makes reference to this psalm. So it's, uh, it's clearly got something to say. I, I've, I thought we'd just quickly run through. So we've all kind of read the word. So. Um, in the things that I've sent you, why do the nations mob together? Um, I, I've gone for that um, mobbing together. You know, often it, you'll kind of find things like why do they rage or why they're in turmoil. Um, the actual kind of Hebrew word has the the context of being together, coming together. It's a kind of a, it's an agitation because we're in our togetherness, as as opposed to an inner um, agitation that's in me. So I, I, I've gone for that kind of idea. Why do the nations mob together? The peoples contemplate vanity. Um, I, I always think. Actually, it's an incredibly good example of the modern world in many ways. Um, all kinds of thinking and, and hours get spent on ideas that in the end don't lead anywhere, vanity. And then people get wound up by it and get themselves into a state. So you saw it just the other night in, in the French elections. Um, now, that doesn't mean to say there aren't things that we shouldn't protest about and get involved with. But it's just it becomes the default and the natural state for the world. But anyway, that's a, I'm now preaching rather than teaching. So I need to kind of stay, <laughs> need to stay focused. Um, so the kings of the earth, they promote themselves. The rulers take counsel together against Yahweh, against his anointed Messiah, saying, so what are the kind of things they're saying, let's pull away from their restraints and throw off their ties from us. Again, it does feel very modern. Um, we don't want these restraints. That's an, a bad thing. One of the worst things you can do in the world today is kind of put restraints on somebody. We're kind of almost taught right the way through primary school 
um, that the you know the, the the greatest freedom is you know you can be anything you want to be even though you're not very good at it anything you want to be you can say it you can be a dinosaur if you want whatever but that those restraints that that actually are beneficial to us because they give us purpose and they give us meaning um, meaning and purpose is always narrow and restrictive it always closes things down I'm supposed to be this therefore I can't be that um, but the world doesn't like that it wants to throw those restraints off and throw those ties away um, he who sits in the heavens will laugh. And there's a kind of, yeah, my, uh, let me read the passage and then we'll unpack it. <laughs> my Lord will hold them in contempt. Then he'll speak to them in his anger and he'll disturb them in his hot temper. And quoting, but still I've consecrated my king on my holy hill on Zion. I'll tell of the decree, Yahweh said to me, you are my son. Today I've confirmed you. So ask of me and I'm going to give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. And you'll hasten them with an iron club. You're going to smash them to pieces as if they were pieces of pottery. So now be wise, you kings. Take heed, you earthly leaders. Serve Yahweh in awe and celebrate him with trembling. Honor kiss the sun so that he's not angry and you don't wander from the way because his temple will soon be stoked and blessed are those who take refuge in him. So that's the whole flow. And actually, as we stop and we look at kind of section by section, we find right up front we, we get quoted in the context of Jesus' passion. I've I've put the um, the actual anointing verse from the Passion, uh, one of several, Mark 14 here. Um, now, while Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, reclining at table, a woman, who we know is Mary, came with an alabaster jar of costly aromatic oil, a pure nard, and after breaking it open, the jar, she poured it on his head. And I, I use this verse because it, it, it highlights the fact that the nard is oil-based. It's a real kind of anointing going on. Now, the, the actual reference, as we find it, we find it, it quoted in Acts, um, um, Peter stands up a few days after Pentecost or a few weeks after Pentecost um, in Acts 4 <clears throat> and he's, he's preaching he says why do the nations mob together and the peoples contemplate vanity the kings of the earth promote themselves and against anointed so that's the, the verse we've just read <laughs> um, he actually quotes it in Acts 4 <clears throat> and, he, and then he goes on to say for truly in this city against your holy servant so he first he quotes the verse and then he unpacks it in this city against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel they were gathered together so you can see the the, the, the run of words taking counsel together against his anointed so he quotes that verse and then he highlights that actually it happened Pontius Pilate who's uh, with the Gentiles and with the people of Israel and they were all gathered together in um, that's Acts 4 and, and of course that is in the context of them executing him because Pontius Pilate is, Pilate is there it's Jesus' passion. Um, but actually, Matthew is even more explicit. Um, during that week, um, um, I've called it Controversy Tuesday, on the Tuesday when Jesus is in the temple, he's come in on the Sunday and uh, and everything has been, well, he's come in on Sunday riding the colt. Everybody's cheering, putting down the, the, the you know, um, uh, palm leaves and, and so on. And um, and then he comes in the next day and um, he has a kind of a, a revival in the temple because it takes the the, uh, the priests by surprise. Because um, on the on the first day, sometimes we we blur them all together. On the first day, he gets to the temple, it's late, and he just goes home. Second day, he comes in, and the crowds are with him, and the kids are dancing, and they're singing songs, and there's and um, and people criticise him because they're and he heals the sick, and so the lame and the deaf are getting healed, and uh, he's really got the initiative against the priests. And so the next day, which is the Tuesday, the, the priests have arranged things and it doesn't go so well for Jesus the next day. So I call it Controversy Tuesday. So he walks into the temple and he's, there's a kind of tag team set up and they all start working against him. Um, and the way Matthew describes it, he says, now when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they assembled together. He uses that little phrase. And actually, if you look at the, the Greek of Matthew's gospel, what you find is that he's... Um, He's taken the Greek exactly from the Septuagint, from the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So Psalm 2, verse 2, part B. Um, if you actually try and read this, um, uh, Apcontes, uh, no, Archon, yeah, Archontes, so the leaders or rulers. Uh, what's that one? Um, Suna, Sunaco, oh, I, I didn't know all these. Sunaco, something or other it is. Sunatecton, I think, Epi, to, Auto. <laughs> the rulers take counsel. I, out together this is quite funny actually I'm I've got my little clicker here to click through and I'm, I'm actually using it as if I'm doing a presentation I'm currently pointing at my screen but you can't see that <laughs> the rulers take counsel together 
and the, the Greek of Matthew's um, gospel actually is, is word for word is the same. So you've got the Sadducees gather themselves together, that gather themselves together and take counsel together. The Greek is identical. So it's, it's a clear kind of sense in which Matthew is wanting to draw our attention to this. So you go on in the psalm. So we, we're seeing something about the psalm touches the anointing that Jesus experiences during that last week, the week of his passion. So the Messiah, as we go on through the psalm, verse 4, starts speaking um, about God. So I put God in brackets, put Father. So he who sits in the heavens will laugh. And this is the, effectively the Messiah speaking. My Lord, which is Adonai, Adonai, and the I um, suffix makes it my Lord, will hold them in contempt. And then he will speak to them in his anger and disturb them in his hot temper. And then he he's kind of, if you like, speaking now, it's God speaking, God the Father. So God the Father now speaks about his Messiah. And so God the Father now is saying, but I have consecrated my king on my holy hill, Zion. I've made it happen. Um, God the Father keeps going on. I've consecra yeah, consecrated my king on my hill. So consecrated um, is now sack. Um, which is the little Hebrew word that's used of the drink offering. So um, the, the drink offering was something you poured out. Um, and the, the word consecrated here is I poured out. Um, in this context, it's poured out on. It's the kind of the way I've put the thing there. The, the on I put in italics because it can be there or it doesn't have to be. Um, so I've, it's again, it's reinforcing the idea of this as being the Messiah. I've consecrated him. I've actually poured onto him. He's gone through the Messiah moment. And it's in as he goes through this Messiah moment, he becomes, he's my king on my holy hill. Well, obviously that clearly does speak to, the, again, the, the passion moment, because that is the time that Jesus is in Jerusalem and up there in the temple, and it, the conflict is happening in that context, on God's holy hill in Zion, i.e. within the environment, and, and he is becoming the king. Um, it's interesting, though, the, the kind of the whole concept or the whole um, place of the, the drink offering and the pouring out because although it's a different psalm we'll probably do it in this series when we look at them there's a the bit where it talks about my I am poured out um, and Jesus himself is not just uh, he actually becomes a drink offering as well as the sacrificial offering uh, but that's a, another story we'll, we'll save that for another day but uh, just kind of drawing out really the, the, the relationship of that the word Nelsac um, and consecrated with the idea of having been anointed having gone through an anointing um, and he goes on, now it's the Messiah speaking again, and he reporting now the words of the Father, so he says, I will tell of the decree, in other words, and then he get, explains, Yahweh said this to me, so I'm now going to tell you something that God said to me, you are my son, today I've confirmed you, and that little phrase, you are my son, I, I've highlighted the my, because we've had a lot of the my's, but it's going in all sorts of directions, my Lord, that's up, my King, my Holy Hill, now my son, kind of really draws out that father-son relationship you are my son today i've confirmed you um, and god the father speaks about his messiah he says ask of me i'll give you the nations for your inheritance i don't know why i put all of this in i, I wanted to yeah okay we're gonna get on to it now because actually that that little phrase my son of course um is is used at jesus's baptism so just as jesus was coming up out of the water he saw the heavens split apart and the spirit was descending on him like a dove um, and of course, um, uh, then God speaks over him. So here's the Spirit saying, and, and it, the Spirit says, um, "This is my Son, my beloved, in whom I'm well pleased." Um, so there's a, and here is Jesus telling us of the decree. It's unlikely that the people all heard those words. We we know that John Jesus heard them, and John says he heard them too, but the majority of people didn't hear them. Um, but Jesus has no doubt reported this story to his disciples. So there is a sense in which he's declared the decree. This is what Yahweh said to me. This is what my father said. As I came up out of the water, he said, you are my son. And that little phrase, my son, was recognized by the rabbis in Jesus' day as a messianic title because of this psalm. So it's not just, oh, you're my kid, nice one, son. It actually is a title. It was recognized in that way. Um, and so as Jesus comes out of the water, the father declares over him, you really are the Messiah. You are my son. You are the son of Psalm 2. And it's got a whole lot of other layers kind of mixed in there with it. Um, my beloved, if you actually read the Greek, we normally say you are my beloved son. We kind of split the my with the word beloved. Uh, the Greek actually reads, you are my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. So there's kind of three parts to it. You are my son, which belongs here to Psalm 2. 
Um, and then um, in whom I am well pleased, which um, belongs to Isaiah and, and the servant, uh, suffering servant passages, um, there the Hebrew normally reads, um, in whom my soul delights, but the Septuagint version of the Old Testament um, actually has the exact same phrase, in whom I am well pleased, that Matthew uses there. So Matthew is drawing attention to the fact that this, as Jesus comes up out of the water, he is quoted over from Psalm 2 and from Isaiah 42, and in the middle, and he's my beloved. We say, well, that's just David. You know, that's the name David. But actually, my beloved is another messianic character. <laughs> and the, the beloved is the bridegroom in the book of Song of Solomon. 23 times, I think it's referred to. He's the beloved, the beloved. It's the only character who's called the beloved. But um, um, And the beloved is the bridegroom. And Jesus actually takes that image on himself. Uh, he actually introduces some of his messiahship, unusually when he talks very early on about the bridegroom when the bridegroom is with his disciples they're not going to fast but when then he's not there anymore they won't and that that theme gets developed through the new testament um and, and so you actually have in this statement as jesus comes up out of the water this my son which belongs to psalm 2 my beloved which is another character that hadn't yet been associated but belongs to something of the messiahship that jesus is going to exercise and in whom my soul delights he's going to be a suffering servant so he's not just going to be a kind of conquering king. He's also got this element of suffering. So all of those ideas are kind of layered um, into those words as they're spoken over Jesus. And they all, as I say, that the, the anchor point for the, everything here is in Psalm 2. You see why I, I say this is quite a kind of a rich and deep psalm when, he, when you understand Jesus' messiahship in it all. And there's a kind of a, a promise in the position, i.e. the position of being my son, because <laughs> it goes on in Psalm 2, ask of me, and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. So I've, I've put the kind of the, those verses that come from the New Testament in the mix here. So the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said to him, I'll give you all of these if. And this, of course, is, is juxtaposed in the Gospels. The baptism and the temptations, these words of the devil, are put right next to each other because they are part. The, the, the temptation is not just a random list. It is very specifically a challenge to the things that have been said over Jesus. Um, we're not going to look at that passage tonight, so I'm just I'm not specifically unpacking that. But very specifically, the idea of my son is going to receive from the father, not from the devil, the nations of the earth. And the devil tempts him with the sense of you can have them quickly. If the ultimate game is the nations, then why don't you get them from me? And it will be a lot easier. <laughs> it will be a lot simpler. But the ultimate game is not the nations. And that's perhaps part of what's nuanced in there is that, it, that somehow it's not just that God needs to to be a great dictator and rule everything. Um, the objectives for them are something slightly different. And this the whole of Jesus' messiahship, including the suffering servant who suffers on behalf of his people, is a part of his messiahship, not just owning the nations, but they are promised. They go with being the my son in this kind of context. And I always like, of course, the fact, you know, as you get it from Acts, as Jesus is uh, as ascending at the beginning of Acts, he says, you're going to be my witnesses to the farthest, end, farthest parts of the earth. And that idea, the ends of the earth, comes again out of Psalm 2. It's part of the promise that belongs to the sun that is in view in Psalm 2. So we, we're going at quite a speed. <laughs> I, pretty, I, I can't hear anybody. Anyone still there? Oh, no. Yes, yeah, still here. Yeah, you are. Good. Uh, it's just nice to know you're all still there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here talking at a camera. It's not my natural way. <laughs> no. It's nice, it's nice to hear your voice, Barry. <laughs> yes. So yeah. the, the last kind of area is, is of course, as I said, the, this psalm is referenced in, in terms of Jesus' ascension. Um, and, of course, in the Ascension, as I've already quoted, mentioned the verse, um, Psalm 45 is quoted in Hebrews 1, 9 of Jesus' Ascension, his resurrection and Ascension. You've loved righteousness, you've hated lawlessness, so God has anointed you, so the anointing again, over your companions with the oil of rejoicing. So we've had oil of perfume, oil of rejoicing, the oil of the Holy Spirit baptism, if you like. <laughs> um, in this context, we suddenly find, if you like, that the, the context of the of now Jesus in his position as king and as reigning over things starts to come into into view in the psalm. So now be wise, it says. <coughs> wise you kings, take heed, you earthly leaders. Serve Yahweh in awe and celebrate him with trembling. And I've just kind of put next to it that, that um, reference from Matthew 25, of course, where Jesus says of himself, so when the Son of Man comes in his glory, so this belongs to his ascension, not, not in his incarnation, but 
when he comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he sits on the glorious throne and all of the nations will be assembled you see this he's kind of drawing together things that are put into the promise of this psalm all the nations will be assembled before him and he'll separate them one from another like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats I, i've highlighted the word nations because obviously it, it ties here it's the nations that have been promised to him and now it's challenging the kings and the rulers to take uh, to take um take heed of of the um of the sun take heed of the sun um because actually sometimes we hear that passage being applied to individuals which it isn't it's very explicit all the way through it's nations it's almost something to do with the whole culture there's a sense of of the, the judgment that jesus brings which is not about the damnation of individuals but it is about the endorsement of cultures and i think there is clearly something because i've talked on this before and you it's demonstrable that as the gospel takes root in the culture something in the culture changes and actually it does prosper and so um, there's better education there is better sanitation and even those who don't follow Jesus somehow um, do better in a culture that has had a heavy Christian influence um, it, people don't like you saying it but it is just demonstrably true and it's something that we we need to be cautious of because coming from the kind of traditions that, that that I come from you know I don't want to associate with Christendom and yet there is still a benefit in Christendom it's not the kingdom it's not salvation but there is still benefit to people it's better to live under Christian law than Sharia law so that will get me into trouble but we're only going to put this on a secret YouTube channel so <laughs> I'll get away with that it is better it just really is and we mustn't forget that because we've given too much away in one sense and when we fought for it we fought for it for the wrong reasons we fought for it because i feel offended if you take that away from me not because actually it's better for the well-being of everybody if we maintain these standards within our culture and we aspire uh, and, and we aspire to these things rather than despising them but anyway that's another another story and it's not really to do with the text so let's keep back <laughs> let's get back to it so it goes on in psalm 2 so serve, serve Yahweh with reverence. I really had that verse in the one before. And it finishes them in honor, kiss the sun. Some translations you'll see honor the sun. Some will put kiss the sun. Some really modern ones don't like either. Um, and it, it's worth just kind of uh, touching on that. The, um, the, the part of the, the, the honor and kiss really aren't the issue. Um, it's actually the word sun. And they, they try and blend it in. Because what they, they say is that unusually here in Psalm 2, the word sun here is bar rather than ben. Um, so in ancient Hebrew, the, the word for sun is Ben. Um, as you get later, um, after they come back from um, Babylon, the, the, the word Bar comes in. And this is a bit early because Psalm 2 is too early for that. And so um, it's thought that, well, somehow the text has got corrupted. We therefore need to rework it. And so you'll find some modern translations put something like on a purity or something like along those lines. Um, but actually, even the Septuagint, the word sun is in there. And... Um, and actually, I, I think a much better understanding, which is is there in certain linguistic scholars, would, would argue that they say that, um, that the, the word son has come in early as a title rather than as a description. So obviously I've got a kid. He is my son. He's my Ben, my Ben E, my son. <laughs> but actually, um, Bar, which becomes from later Aramaic, actually already existed in the nations around it. And the only times we find it being used in in really early Hebrew here's one of the occasions we find it also in Daniel that's a bit later and there's one of the Psalms we find it as well um, it's always used where son is more of a title than it is a description so he is the son rather than he's my son you get the idea at the beginning of the psalm he was my son but now as we get to the end he's the son so he's the bar does that make sense and I prefer that I, I, I'm very upfront about the fact that my bias is that I like things that show you Jesus <laughs> so um, I, I not only would put the word the son in there but it is kind of capital letters the son it's son as a title for definite um, that all may and I have put the little quote from John you know because actually again it ties in theologically with Jesus' own statement that everyone should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. So they're serving Yahweh with reverence, that's honoring him. And then they're supposed to kiss with honor, because the, the word can, the, the word literally means to kind of uh, make um, touch contact. And it's used therefore of kissing, but it can also be the idea of kind of, you know, touching and <sighs> in ways and honoring. Um, and so it could be either, that's why I put the little hyphen in it. So it's not that there are two words there, it's one word that could be honor, could be kiss. I quite like the two going together. So we're serving the Lord, but actually we need to somehow touch the sun um, to really make it all go well with us, <laughs> if, if you see how, see how that works. 
and he says and so in touching the sun so that he's not angry with you and you don't wander from the way because his temple would soon be stoked and blessed is everyone who takes refuge in him and that kind of judgmental side we we sometimes feel awkward with um because uh, and the all I all I can say in that is 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 um you know scripture has these kind of words in there. Um the 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 scripture does not want to hide the fact that God has an emotional response. Um from a philosophical point of view, we find that sometimes a bit distasteful. So we theologians come up with words like immutable for God. Immutable means he doesn't feel anything. But God does feel stuff. And um and actually the Hebrew context concept of things like anger are much more a kind of unfocused disturbedness than they are a kind of focused meanness. Um, so it's partly it's the nuances of language why we find them difficult but it, it, it scripture is quite clear that there is something of um, the grace that we are submitting ourselves to from jesus but that grace only makes sense if there's something that we need saving from and there's something therefore of the possibility of something else and we find you know i put the quote in from revelation just to kind of draw home and um, so they said to the mountains to the rocks fall on us hide us from the face of the one who's seated on the throne from the wrath of the lamb so the wrath of the lamb He's the lamb slain on, on the throne in Revelation, but he's still got wrath. And that, that idea, that word for wrath, you see, we focused on, bang, I'm hitting you, as opposed to, it's turned me up. I've watched so many children being killed. I've watched um, young girls being trafficked. I have, If I don't have something stirred up in me, then there's something wrong. I'm not really righteous. It should disturb me from that position. And, and the lamb does have that. So this this kind of um, this verse as it finishes is it's moved from the consecration, the placing of my son. It's moved through the words, and we've, the nations have been promised to him. And now he stepped into the place where he is the son. And somehow the worship of God means the acknowledgement and the touching of the son. Um, and actually, in that context, and actually something of that, in however we understand it, saves us from the fact that we have participated in the things that have wound God up, and it, it provides a safe place for us so we're kind of running to the end there you go it's the end of the, the presentation so i'm going to stop sharing the, the powerpoint slide and um, hopefully everybody's face will now appear back oh hang on how do i get how do i get you back um this is oh no hang on i can see some little bits here so let's see let's go there yep and now i can bring you all up there and um, so before i turn off the uh, the recording does anyone want to ask any questions <laughs> I can see everybody's turned their microphones off, which is very kind of you, <laughs> because it means that I don't hear you eating your dinner. But uh, does anyone want to does anyone want to ask anything or make any kind of comments in before we hit, hit the uh, stop recording button? No. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. It was a good thing. It's a good thing, is it? Thank you, Barry. That you're very encouraging. <laughs> yeah. No, it's. it's... You know, actually, once you got into the teaching and the technology worked great, it was a really good evening. Thank you. It was, it was a really good time. Good. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say that. And I like the way that you put the diff particularly the point about, you know, his wrath being a stirring up. Yeah. Because of the injustices in the world rather than just, you know, some kind of random feeling that he has about yeah. about me. No, and that's what I mean is that the Hebrew word is much more to do with the inner state than it is to do with the the kind of vengeance on something. Mm. Whereas the English word wrath is often has the nuance of what hits me, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Barry. Good. Are you there, Sarah? Yes, no, I'm here. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. Very, no, very good, um, very interesting, very kind of thought-provoking. I love the... Um, the linkings with the anointings, the three anointings, that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never really thought about that before. I do have a sort of question. It's not really a, a sort of a well-formed question, but just as you were speaking, I was just wondering um, kind of about if you've had any thoughts about application of this psalm. Good question. <laughs> Good question. Because <laughs> um, it's very profound and it's very deep yeah. and it reveals Jesus in this particular way, which is yeah. fantastic. But I was just thinking about, I want, you know, I was just thinking about, is there a, is there an application? I began to think that when you mentioned the temptation. Yeah. Um, that that's when I was beginning to apply it to myself, if you see what I mean. Yeah, and I was just wondering if if you've had thoughts about that, or if, because in a way, it's, it would be quite a, a challenging psalm to 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 preach to a congregation on a Sunday morning, for example, and how you would draw out 
application um, in that context. Yeah. Um, but I just wondered if you'd thought about it. Well, or interesting. I've never any... thought about it until you just asked it, Sarah. But actually, I, I think in one of my books, I actually did use this psalm with an application. And, it, and funny thing mm -hmm. is, it, it, it's when you just said, it was exactly the bit you just said. <laughs> oh, really? How oh, interesting. Mm. Made, I've thought I a lot about the temptations in my life, you see, how they apply. To well, I, I made the point so. that the things that, that Jesus is, is responding and shaping his behavior according to the things God speaks over him. So I highlighted several areas where we know what God says to Jesus and mm. how he responds and reacts out of it. So actually we see out of the, if you go and look at the context of this psalm with the, the nations being given to him, if you go and look at the suffering servant, you also find that the suffering servant is a light to the nations, he's a light to the Gentiles. Um, mm. And so what you find is that whenever God speaks, those things are challenged. They become the focus, if you like, of the battle. And we often see temptation as being kind of little mini generic things, whereas I, I kind of, the thing I was drawing out is that it's much more to do with what, what we've been gifted with by the Lord. I, and calling is a gifting. You know, and I said this thing about, you know, the world says, well, I want to be whatever I want to be. But actually, the truth is, there's only purpose in being what we're made to be. Um, and so when whenever God communicates something of what it is that we're supposed to be, we, we regularly will find um, that it is challenged. That's the And that's the key temptation. You know, yes. the, the, the temptation is not, as we've kind of trivialized it, you know, shall I eat another biscuit? Um, when I'm on a diet or whatever. And then, you know, that's a temptation I give into every now and again, I have to confess. <laughs> and I'm not making excuses, I'm just saying, but actually much more key are those things that come against the things that we, that we have that feeling like the Lord has said something to us and we're supposed to walk in that. And actually Jesus goes through exactly that same experience. I found that very encouraging personally, mm. that mm. actually the way Jesus is guided is not dissimilar to the way I'm guided which is it's a combination of stuff that is in the Bible with the sense of the Spirit speaking it now, and how does that apply to me, if that makes sense. Mm, and, mm. and that has to be contested for sometimes. So that's, that is the one time I think I have used it application-wise. Okay, no, that's really helpful. I think I was thinking, when you, you were saying about shortcut, I think I was thinking about, um, you know, God spoke to Abraham about Isaac, and then... Yeah, I don't know, he got impatient or he had an idea and, point, yeah. you, you, you know, um, Ishmael was the result of that kind of thing. Sort of try, understanding what God, God has said and what God has promised, but sort of trying to make it happen yourself. Yeah. Yeah, well, that might be a... Sometimes taking the easy route. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because yeah. as, as that context, if, in, in the, if, you, if you apply the suffering servant suffering servant doesn't get the nations till he suffered for them <laughs> mm, whereas that's right, yes. temptation from the devil is kind of you know, all you need to do is give me some give me some credit <laughs> mm, you know? mm, so yeah mm. that's very good a really good question thank you very much sarah no you're welcome that's okay so what, what i'm going to do now is i'm going to stop recording we don't all have to disappear at this point but um so for those watching the recording we're going to say goodbye to you see you next time <laughs>